Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm instructor Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is pneumatic compressors. Our objective is to discuss pneumatic compressors and compressor control on an extremely introductory level. As you are no doubt aware, compressors and pneumatic systems are analogous to pumps and hydraulic systems and that they are mechanical power to fluid power converters driven by a prime mover. Like hydraulic pumps, there are numerous types of pneumatic compressors and different means of control. In the interest of forward progress, today's lecture is a rapid overview of these topics. More detailed lectures on individual compressor types and control schemes may be warranted in mechanics and industrial control classes. Compressors are divided into two general families, dynamic and positive displacement. Dynamic compressors, like turbines or centrifugal compressors, are not within the scope of this particular lecture and will limit our discussion to positive displacement compressors. Within the positive displacement branch, there are countless variations and sub-variations you might encounter in the field. However, the main types are reciprocating piston-style compressors and rotating vane and screw type compressors. Occasionally, one may encounter scroll style compressors, which may or not be considered rotary depending on design. Let's take a quick look at these four types of compressors, starting with a reciprocating piston style compressor. As the name implies, a reciprocating piston style compressor makes use of a piston that goes up and down i.e. reciprocates inside a cylinder barrel. Inlet and outlet valves selectively open and close such that air is drawn in from the environment on a downstroke and compressed and expelled into the pneumatic system on an upstroke. Consider this simplified diagram of a reciprocating piston style compressor, including the prime mover shaft, the crankshaft and connecting rod, a piston, and an inlet valve from the environment on the left, and an outlet valve to the pneumatic system on the right. Two phases define a reciprocating piston style compressor, suction and compression, both of which can be described using Boyle's law which you remember correctly is expressed as P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. A lot of times, Boyle's law in pneumatic systems is applied to the act of compression, a reduction in volume, where if you reduce volume, pressure increases. Boyle's law also works in reverse. If you increase volume, pressure decreases. Let's examine the suction phase first. The crankshaft and connector rod translates the rotational movement of the prime mover shaft into the vertical linear movement, drawing the piston down. During the downstroke, the inlet valve on the left remains open and the outlet valve on the right remains closed. As the piston descends, volume in the barrel increases and pressure decreases. Given we started at atmospheric conditions, any increase in volume and consequent reduction in pressure makes the expanding cylinder a vacuum or less than atmospheric condition. Via the open inlet valve, environmental air outside the cylinder at atmospheric pressure is pushed into the less than atmospheric cylinder. The suction phase ends and the inlet valve closes. The upstroke or compression phase is essentially the same, only in reverse. The crankshaft and connector rod translates the rotational movement of the prime mover shaft into upwards linear vertical movement, pushing the piston up. During a majority of the upstroke, both the inlet valve and outlet valve remain closed. As the piston ascends, volume in the barrel decreases and pressure increases. At a certain point, the outlet valve opens and expels the compressed air into the pneumatic system. Compression phase ends, the outlet valve closes, and the inlet valve opens, ready to begin another suction phase. What I've described is the operation of a single stage reciprocating piston style compressor. While single stage compressors do exist, it's often more efficient to perform compression using more than one stage. Consider a two stage reciprocating piston style compressor driven by the same shaft. While the primary cylinder is in the compression stage with an open outlet, the secondary cylinder is in the suction phase with an open inlet. Previously compressed air from the primary cylinder is drawn into the secondary. The other half of the cycle, the cylinder switch rolls and the valves change states. The inlet in the primary opens and the outlet closes as the primary piston descends. The inlet in the secondary closes and the outlet opens as the secondary piston rises. The primary cylinder is in the suction phase, pulling in more air from the environment, while the secondary cylinder is in the compression phase, expelling the doubly compressed air into the pneumatic system. The process then repeats itself over and over. In this fashion, the primary cylinder sucks up environmental air, performs initial compression, hands it off to the secondary cylinder, which again sucks it up, further compresses it, and expels it into the pneumatic system. Those individuals with a solid grasp of the combined gas laws will note that this reduction in volume and consequent increase in pressure will undoubtedly result in a temperature rise. It is for this reason a multi-stage reciprocating piston-style compressor might include an intercooler between stages that cools the compressed air of the first stage before it enters the second. Intercoolers allows this compression-induced heat rise of the first stage to be dissipated, 
thus increasing the efficiency of the second stage in the larger system. At a minimum, even those reciprocating piston stock compressors lacking intercoolers often include cooling fins in the pistons for this purpose. Let's now take a brief look at rotary vein compressors, which behave almost identical to a hydraulic vein pump. You'll recall a vein pump consists of an off-center rotor with sliding veins inside a cam ring. Vein compressors are no different. As the off-center rotor rotates inside the stationary cam ring, the sliding veins create an expanding space on the inlet side, creating a suction action which pulls in environmental air. As the off-center rotor continues to turn, it seals off the entrapped air, reduces in volume, thus compressing the entrapped air and expelling it through the outlet port. The third type of common compressor is the rotary screw compressor, which is a little difficult to illustrate using simplistic diagrams, so rather than learning how to use computer graphics software, I just stole these publicly available images from Wikipedia. A rotary screw compressor consists of a closely mated male and female screw, where the thread spirals the length like a coil of DNA. As the intermeshed spiral rotors turn, they form chambers within the thread in the casing walls, enclosed by the circumferential edge of the spiral. As the individual chambers move from inlet to outlet, volume is reduced, compressing the gas and expelling it into the pneumatic system. Similarly, a scroll compressor is out of my artistic league, so I absconded with these publicly available images illustrating their operation. A scroll compressor uses two interleaving scrolls to compress air. Depending on design and how you look at it, a scroll compressor may or may not be considered a truly rotary device, since some designs utilize a fixed scroll while the other orbits eccentrically without rotating, thereby trapping and compressing pockets of air between the scrolls. An entirely different design uses synchronized co-rotating scrolls, but with offset centers of rotation, where the relative motion is the same as if one were orbiting. An apt analogy I once heard used to describe a scroll compressor is squeezing a tube of toothpaste only the tube is not flat, it's a spiral. As interleaving scrolls inevitably draw together, they squeeze and compress the entrapped air and push it towards the outlet. If we were to extend this analogy to the previously discussed rotary screw compressor, one might envision performing the same squeezing action, only doing so in a helical fashion. Now that we've got a rapid fire introduction to common compressors, let's quickly discuss compressor control. The purpose of compressor control is to efficiently match compressed air supply to compressed air demand. You don't want too much and you don't want too little. Additionally, you don't want to spend a lot of money doing it. Consider the questionable choice of simply not controlling the compressor and letting it run all day. Here I've illustrated a motor prime mover, compressor, receiver, and a pneumatic system. In theory, if the demand of the pneumatic system perfectly matched that of the compressor output, this could work with the receiver simply acting as an intermediary, allowing a chance for the recently compressed air to cool and any impurities and moisture to settle out. If, however, the pneumatic system experienced any idle time and demand dropped, pressure in the receiver would quickly rise to potentially catastrophic levels. For this reason, one might include a safety pressure relief valve in the receiver. As previously, if the demand of the pneumatic system perfectly matched that of the compressor output, the safety pressure relief valve remains closed and the system functions as intended. If, however, the pneumatic system experiences any idle time and demand dropped, pressure in the receiver again quickly rises only this time, rather than risking a rupture, the safety pressure relief valve opens and vents the excess pressure back to atmosphere. When demand increases, pressure in the receiver drops, and the safety pressure relief valve recloses, the system continues to function as intended. If this pump and dump type of compressor control seems hopelessly inefficient, you are right. Why go to the trouble of compressing all that air if you're not going to use it and just dump it? This is terribly inefficient. Additionally, these two primitive means of compressor control or lack thereof, rely on perfectly balancing the output of the compressor and the demand of the system with very little wiggle room. For this reason, other styles of more efficient and flexible compressor control exist. Compressor control schemes can be divided into two general categories, fixed speed and variable speed control methods. As implied by the title, a fixed speed control method keeps the speed of the compressor constant and varies the output of the compressor with valves or other movable components. In contrast, a variable speed control scheme can ramp up or ramp down compressor speed to match demand or just turn it off. One constant speed method of varying a compressor's output is by placing a throttle or modulation valve at the compressor's inlet, thus reducing or outright blocking the amount of air introduced on the suction phase and indirectly reducing the compressor's output. If you do encounter a dynamic compressor, you might also find the output of a dynamic compressor similarly throttled, thus directly reducing its output. 
Another constant speed method of varying a compressor's output is to adjust displacement per revolution with movable internal components. For example, a variable displacement vane compressor could adjust the eccentricity of the off-center rotor, where a perfectly centered rotor produces no flow and a fully off-centered rotor produces maximum flow. Similarly, a variable displacement rotary screw type compressor could adjust the travel length of the spiral rotor by selectively opening or bypassing chambers along the housing. Let's now examine some variable speed compressor control methods. One simple variable speed compressor control method is to start the compressor when you need it and stop it when you don't. Viewers will recall we examined start stop compressor control on the air preparation elements in pneumatic systems lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. In this style of compressor control, a pressure switch in the receiver serves as the primary feedback to the motor about the status of pressure in the receiver. Based on this feedback, the pressure switch selectively starts or stops the motor. Below the set value of the pressure switch, the motor prime mover drives the compressor to fill the receiver. If pressure in the receiver rises above the set value of the pressure switch, the pressure switch turns the motor off. If pressure in the receiver falls below the reset value, the pressure switch restarts the motor and drives the compressor to refill the receiver back up to the set value. In this fashion, pressure in the receiver stays inside a predictable span that the pneumatic system can then draw upon. Start-stop style compressor control is pretty efficient because the compressor either runs fully loaded or is fully off. However, motors above a certain size can't be started or stopped as often as this control method may require without overheating, making it only suitable for small and medium duty applications. While on the subject of motor starting, I should mention there are varying degrees of complexity and overlap for these types of compressor control. For example, to reduce the inrush current demand associated with starting a motor using the start-stop style of compressor control, one might also simultaneously throttle the inlet valve during a start, thus briefly unloading the compressor while the motor started. Lastly, an increasingly popular means of variable speed compressor control is to directly vary the speed of the prime mover driving the compressor with a device known as a variable frequency drive, or VFD, or inverter, or motor drive a power electronics device that varies applied voltage and excitation frequency to a motor under its direction, thus directly controlling its rotational speed. Low demand is met with low speed rotation. If demand increases, rotational speed increases. Compressors and motors intended to work with motor drives should be designed for variable speed operation to ensure proper, efficient, and safe operation. We'll examine motor drives in greater detail in later lectures. All right, that is it for this super brief introduction to compressors and compressor control. Like I mentioned earlier, this was not meant to be a thorough lecture by any means as my cartoonish diagrams can only get you so far. This being said, I hope you gained at least a general idea of what to expect when you rip a compressor open in a hands-on lab and watch its guts spill out on the floor. Lastly, the compressor control schemes I blazed through are not as simple as one might initially suspect. Some of these are quite complicated and necessitate an understanding of analog sensors and PID closed loop control. This being said, I do hope I supplied at least a brief overview of some of the methods employed. In conclusion, this lecture introduced the reciprocating piston compressor, the rotating vane compressor, the rotary screw compressor, and the scroll compressor. Additionally, we briefly discussed fixed speed compressor control methods like valve throttling and variable displacement, and variable speed compressor control methods like start stop and motor drives. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.